how much of a big deal is that to rural mental health? I think it's huge. Um, farmers and ranchers are three times more likely to take their own lives than the general population of similar demographics outside of agriculture. You know, there's a lot of pressures and they're all outside of your control, just at the mercy of the weather and the markets and the banker and the legislature who are making decisions, you know, in clean shoes in Denver, far, far away from these guys that are out here calving and checking cows at three o'clock in the morning. And it's economically tough. And there's definitely a stigma. And that's one of the things that Santa Masso and I work work on is we've talked about our own mental health struggles and our own experiences and saying that, you know, if we can sit here and talk about it, then you can too. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Monico Carrillo. What's up, Eric? Not much. Pretty excited for, for today's. I mean, we're, we're around here in rural Colorado, and it's always nice to dive deep into to what rural Colorado actually is. So we're excited for today's day, for, for today's guest. Yeah, so us, we grew up on a ranch, so these are always interesting conversations. If they but saw our dad's video, they know he's diving a little deeper into it, too. Yeah, if they checked it out. If they haven't, go check it out. But... Um, yeah, for sure. But we're nothing compared to an expert, I guess you could say, in this field, like like the guests we have on today. So welcome to the show. Thanks Thank for you. having me. And I did see your dad's video. It was you great. Did? Okay, cool. Yeah, I liked Sweet. it. Produced by Inceptions Media. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so we know we know a guy that does some videos. So. <laughs> it's, it's good to have connections, friends yeah. in low places. Yeah. So, so Rachel, for the people who don't know you, can you just give like a little quick like backstory on who you are and what you do. Sure. I'm Rachel Gable. I'm the assistant editor of the Fence Post magazine, and I'm the rural and ag, like, like the rural issues columnist weekly for the Colorado and Denver Gazettes and Colorado Politics, and I'm a farm journalist on Western Ag Network. So I'm just hard to get away from in rural America. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start off by, because I was going through some of your social media stuff as I was doing some research on you, and I thought it was really interesting on your post how you like name each like each cow, you know. Has oh, a, the cow bios, how, yeah. How they, how they have a bio. How'd you come up with that idea? How how is that? <laughs> I was making fun of myself, and I put a picture of a, a goat, and I named her. Oh gosh, what was her name? Linda. And she was a good bowler and a divorcee, mm -hmm. and I was just making fun of myself and women in general, and I just. Um, I just made kind of a bio and I put it with the first one was a goat, but I started doing that every day. And so I've been doing that for over a year now. It was a year in January and I even have a book now of cow bios, but it's just funny. They're just little character sketches of basically rural middle-aged women. <laughs> so, so when you come up with the bio, are you actually like internally like thinking of a person and you're just like, I'm going to make this about it. So sometimes, <laughs> yeah. sometimes. Yeah, I've written them about uh, experiences that I've had or that my friends have had or just funny stuff. And, and I just take a lot of pictures of cows because I'm a lot of fun and very cool. So I just have a lot of pictures on my phone. And like there was one cow that looks like she cut her own bangs. And so I did <laughs> one on a woman that tried to cut her own bangs. It's just It's just goofy. And it's been an interesting thing because... You know, in agriculture, we're always telling people to tell their stories and talk to consumers, but you can't really do that. Like it's, you can't stalk people at Safeway and say, oh, I see you're looking at ground beef. Would you like to hear about my family's ranching operation? <laughs> I mean, you could. I mean, you, you could, could <laughs> but you'd probably be on the news. <laughs> so I think to avoid any charges of misdemeanor weirdness in Safeway, um, you know, if, had I ever said, you know how I'm going to reach consumers and bring rural women together is I'm going to write these little bios and post them with cow pictures and it'll just be fun. But, you know, that's what I did and that's what it, what it, what happened. And it's kind of nice because anytime I can write something that isn't about legislation and doesn't include the word alleged, I'm a, I'm a fan. And I'm just kind of a smart aleck by nature. So the cow bios work really well for me. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a woman, but they were pretty inter interesting when I was going. I was like, pretty funny. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is, this is, I was, I was thinking to myself, like, 
I wonder if she's thinking of like a person actually when she's coming. Like this is them. Becky, but I'm gonna just change the name to sometimes. To <laughs> sometimes my husband pointed out to me that you know you've never named one Rachel. <laughs> and I'm not going to. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> Have you received like any like pushback from that? Like, like animal rights mm-hmm. activists like, oh no, you can't kill them. Like they're. They're so cute. Like they have a name already and all this stuff. Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty um, popular target of the animal rights activists. There's one gal that gets on my page all the time and says, "I can't believe that you're making fun of, uh, making fun of her," and she's headed to the slaughterhouse. Well, a, I'm not making fun of the cow because obviously she's not bowling. Obviously. But <laughs> <laughs> making fun of myself, not that I bowl. And I'm not making fun of people who bowl, so don't don't email Inceptions Media. <laughs> mad about bowling. But it's, but it's, it's interesting that like it's on social media. Like everybody has like a right to to like follow it if you want or not. Like and people instead of choosing to unfollow, they just choose to get in the comments and write yeah. some mean stuff. Yeah, some people like to be trolls. How do you, how do you how do you deal with that? Because I mean, you've been you're telling us that you've been writing as a young age, so. Your life is immersed in this. How do you deal with people like not liking something that you wrote or like the the backlash of it? Well, I've been really lucky because I I think Don Brown, who is a former commissioner of agriculture from Yuma, told me one time that because I had made the comment that I just didn't have much pushback from animal rights activists. Not that I'm complaining, but I just think it's weird because I write so much about the protein industry and about packing, meat packing and stuff like that. And I really don't have that pushback. And he said, well, it's because you're credible. That's why it is, Rachel. It's because you're credibility. And, and I think that that's, that's a lot of it. I've been doing this a long time and I don't go off the handle. I'm, I'm pretty good at what I do and I've been doing it a long time. I, I have the occasional Facebook troll of why are you making fun of the cows and you're going to head them to the slaughterhouse. And I have that stuff, but up to like up until Christmas, I really had no pushback. And then the first gentleman of Colorado had a big Facebook rant about me after I wrote about the wolves that were released, that were uh, captured in Oregon and released in Colorado. Nine of them came from packs with a history of livestock depredation. And I reported that and it was picked up by the big uh, news outlets in Denver and it was not what CPW and the governor's office really wanted out there, but it's what it, I mean, it was what it was. So the first gentleman uh, went on a bit of a Facebook rant about don't listen to anything Rachel says and she's which, mean and hates the, animals which gets, get to just share it a little bit more and people just see it more but for what so what's uh livestock dep- deprivation for someone that doesn't know wolves killing know. cattle and sheep so okay. like what's their argument for wolves like oh that. the big argument is that wolves balance the ecosystem and that they're native to this area and if they come back it's it like restores the ecosystem which i maintain is crap because an ecosystem is constantly fluid. It's always changing. If you have a really Mm -hmm. cold winter, you're going to have winter kill and your ungulate numbers are going to go down and your predator numbers are going to go up and you're going to have hungry predators. And then as the ungulate population rebalances itself, that's what it does. But just putting one species, whether it's a wolf or a bobcat or a mountain lion or, you know, name your photogenic predator that you want to pedestalized if you just concentrate on one then everything else there's 961 species in the state of Colorado and you have to manage all of them not just the pretty ones and the cute ones Mm -hmm. so how crazy do you think that it's someone that that's like kind of I guess in a position to to make the decisions of they come here they don't come here aren't really out and about I guess as much like if you go everyone thinks the wolves I think bears look beautiful because you see I mean, it's Yogi a, Bear and stuff on, on exactly, TV. Bears but have been like normal. It's like, oh, they're teddy bears, they're cute. You see them, the, 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 there's that picture of that uh, Derek Wolf, the football player, that he killed a, uh, a lion. lion. That, and he's huge and he picks them up. He has them, that thing is huge. Like, they are big. Imagine if you're out there hunting or hiking in one of those, you ain't, you ain't getting away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's, it's, like, it's and there's easy. a reason that they're not here no more. Like, if they were really like crucial to the ecosystem, like, they would probably still be here. 
But and they were here. And they were exactly. They there's came a reason the that there's Park. that there's no more. Yeah. Like, we gotta think of ourselves as also being in that ecosystem and not just yeah put it back in just like oh whatever. We get compared a lot to Yellowstone, and we're not Yellowstone. We're we're a smaller state, and we have six million people here. It's not a huge public lands mass like Yellowstone. It's a different it's a different situation, and so to put that kind of situation, that kind of decision about wildlife management to the voters is ballot box biology, and it's a bad idea. Right now, there's a, a mountain lion, bobcat, and lynx hunting ban that's going to probably be on the ballot if they get enough signatures, which is like 124,000 or something stupid. Like, you could stand outside of Whole Foods and get that. Get that in like two hours. Yeah. yeah. So it'll probably be why, on there. Why Whole Foods? Why do you say Whole Foods? Is that where the the, the liberal people are, are Oh, shopping? I don't know. I'm just using oh, okay. it as an example. <laughs> sure. I'm, get, I'm something guessing. Something that's I mean, metro. <laughs> like, you're yeah, not yeah, going to no, have just, people sign it out here. But if you stand in, in metro Denver outside of something like that, then it's easy to get. That's crazy. Like, that disconnect. People in the cities are like, oh, yeah, it's a good idea. But they're just locked into that city perspective. They don't know what's going on outside the city yeah. limits yeah i mean they're not professional wildlife managers a and b they don't have to deal with it my friends um her name is georgia raftopoulos and she's a rancher in the western slope and she took a picture of a wolf track on her place and she had her hand down on the ground in the snow next to it and it was almost as big as her hand really i mean these wow. are big animals they're apex predators and yes, they're neat, and yes, they're pretty, but yes, they're predators, and they kill things. That's crazy. And we had them in the state. They came down to North Park on Sedan Gittleson's place long before we actually released any wolves. And he's had 23, him and that area, there's been 23 depredation incidents. Working dogs, pets, cattle, sheep. Really? That's crazy. Already. With two wolves, wow. <laughs> and we just released another ten. <laughs> we couldn't manage the two we had. <laughs> I was gonna so, fix it. Yeah, it's just a bad idea. And it, you know, if you ban mountain lion, bobcat, and lynx hunting, which lynx lynx are federally and state protected, so it's that's a non-issue. But if you put mountain lions on a pedestal like that and ban the hunting of that, well, that's the only kind of population management that CPW has unless they're having to go out, you know, every time a mountain lion goes into a, into a schoolyard or into a kitchen at a restaurant at a ski resort, which happened not too long ago, or bat at somebody's head when he's sitting in a hotel, um, like a hot tub at, at a resort, CPW is going to have to go and destroy that mountain lion. And they're there because either they were getting pushed out of their native territory because mountain lions are territorial and there's 6 million people in the state or because there's too many of them. So, you know, hunting mountain lions, I'm not a mountain lion hunter because I live in northeastern Colorado, but it's, yes, they're beautiful and yes, they're majestic and all of the things that they are. But hunting is a management tool, and non-management is not management of wildlife. That's so now I've, that I've ge geeked out on you about that's great. this no. is what happens. <laughs> no, this is I what like happens. It. No, that's good. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, we started on social media, and stupidity, now and up. now we're on the 961 species <laughs> in the state of Colorado. There you go. Bryce for impact. We're going to keep doing that's that. That's how we roll here. That's how we go. That's good. That's good. I'm a, tr a tro treasure trove of... Useless but it's facts. Important, it's important for people to know, though, because a lot of people, they're just, like I was saying earlier, they're just locked into their little world and they have no perspective on what's actually affecting the state, not mm -hmm. just like their personal lives. <clears throat> right. And it's easy. I mean, there's a ton of legislation right now that's anti-ag that, that looks good on the surface. You know, we want cleaner air, so we're going to do this, or we want, you know, whatever it is. But when you don't know anything about whatever topic, agriculture or heart surgery, you're not the one to be making the decisions about that. So it reminds me of that uh that one picture that I saw is like a girl's on her laptop and she has a sticker, uh capitalism sucks. But she's using products that were made by capitalism. Mm -hmm. I was like it's a little little awkward when 
they don't understand. It's just because they're just li- listening to the media or whatever is just going out there, just pu- being pushed, pumped out there. But I think it's very important for people kind of like you that you're, you receive the backlash from like the, the first gentleman and you're still like, you're still staying, uh, I guess you're not folding, you know, like right away. Other people, I think that's what's lost in today's, I guess, time era. I don't know what you want to call it, but it's that people, they just like, oh, I better not offend somebody. I better not make somebody mad. So I better just not say that. And they just rather. What are they going to think of me? And I think that's what's lost today. Like in the, in the, what do you consider yourself a writer, journalist or what? what, what? Journalist. And I think that's lost. And I think it's very important though for, for people to see that other perspective of stuff. Yeah. And I, you know, there's, there's a balance there. I make for dang sure (laughs) before I report something like that, that I'm correct. (laughs) <laughs> How much research do you do before before you do uh, put an article out? Oh, quite a bit. But, you know, I have to move quickly because news moves quickly. But, you know, if you're working, you know, the 6 o'clock news kind of mainstream media, you're putting together those 30-second, 45-second, 90-second little deals where you're just kind of skimming the surface. You're giving the who, what, when, where, why, and moving on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And I have the ability to do a deeper dive on that. And so that's that's helpful. And I think agriculture would be a hard thing to report on if you weren't so immersed in it, because there's so many moving parts. And just in Colorado, the number of ag commodities here is super diverse. And there's a lot of them. And there's just a lot of moving parts. And the same with the legislature. Um, There's just a lot of different things going on. But yeah, I make for dang sure that I'm right before I hit post. And you know, that helped me when the first gentleman came unglued. I knew I was right. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been doing this long enough that I wasn't worried about it. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I might have crawled under a desk and wanted to die. But now I'm just like, meh. <laughs> I, that's, I how, that's right. how I feel more things should be. Just the people reporting on it should be like experts in the field. Because you get a lot of people just random experts just, oh, yeah, this happened over here. And I think it's bad. But have you actually dove deep into it? Have you talked to other people who are actually in the field? Like, mm-hmm. where are you getting your sources from? Yeah, sources are a big deal. Well, the other thing is I just don't read the comments. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> like, nothing nothing good <laughs> happens in, like, Facebook comments. Just yeah, stay away. <laughs> Plus, there's probably a bunch of bots and stuff. And, like, you don't even know if they're real. Because, yeah, I mean, we'll get them on social media. Like, a bunch of people start following you and then they disappear, like, in two days, you know, because it's just like random people that have nothing. And those are usually the people <laughs> doing the stuff in the comments yeah. a lot, a lot of times. Um, I'm curious. So uh, I, I seen a, a quote, uh, it goes some, it's some, from you. It was something like to be good at writing. All you have to do is just start writing. You know, that's the only way you're going to get better. And I think that's like with any skill, whatever you want to do, you just have to start doing it. If you never do it, you're never going to get better at it. And that's what, if you go back and listen to episode one, we were, we were horrible. <laughs> please, Still kind please of don't are. check it out. Please it don't, see, please don't see it. But I think that's really important. But what's one of the biggest reasons you think other journalists or writers fail? Oh, I think that they either lose sight of what they want their focus to be, you know, trying to be everything to everybody because you can't be. So you have to be focused on what you want to do. And then you also, you just have to... <clears throat> You just have to do it. You have to keep writing. I mean, we talked a little bit before we came on air about how I started writing. Well, it was taking my 4-H club news to the local paper when I was like 12 or 13 years old. And and she'd give me a coupon to the Dairy Queen and a, run my article. And I thought, man, this is all right. It's a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> what my led fr- you to start writing at 12 years old? Like, what was the... That's not going through a lot of people's head at 12 years old. Well, it was just I was the reporter for my 4-H club, and it was my job to, you know, say that the Castle Rock Aggies met on Thursday night and the president called it to order. I mean, it was not hard-hitting news here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that went to, like, livestock judging team contest results and just kept going. And, uh, you know, my, my first byline in the fence post was in 1989. So... I think you got some experience been at huh? it for yeah. a hot minute or two. And, you know, I, I taught for about 13 years in there too, but I was still freelancing. And so I was doing that early morning, late night, lunch breaks, stuff like that. I, you know, writing is just one of those things that you just do it. You just, 
you either are a writer or you are not. If someone wants to like get into it, like what would your advice be to them? Just find your focus and and find some some editors that'll give you a shot at it. We are we are always looking for freelancers with especially with the Fence Post and the Tri State Livestock News. And like right now there's a national FFA officer that's visiting a chapter not too far from here. And I couldn't be there. So okay, do do one of your kids, one of your members have somebody that wants a byline? Write up a little article. I'll tell you what I think. We'll we'll run it. We'll put some captions with the pictures and you'll have a byline in a in a national magazine. So that those are the kind of things you just need to grab those opportunities and, and take them. So you guys are also like open to helping other people out and giving that I mean like giving them more of an opportunity to kind of get their their feet wet. Mhm. Sure. Yeah, which is not to say that I want to read a whole bunch of their stuff. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so like give me 10 drafts and then give me the, the, yeah. the 11th one I'll read that one. Yeah, get it get it good and then send it to me. How has the industry changed? Because you started your first one, you said it was about 89 to now. Like, how has the industry changed? Oh, it's changed years? tremendously because, you know, there was no, even when I was right out of college in 01, there was not a huge online presence. There was not social media to be able to get that stuff out. There were not podcasts. There was not any of that stuff. It was just print. So it was, it just moved a lot slower. And, so now, you know, you guys could edit this podcast and have it up 10 minutes after I leave. And it just moves a lot faster. And it, you have just a greater audience. And they don't just happen to have to happen to stumble over it, either be a subscriber to the print publication or happen to go into the feed store and see it on the counter. Like, they don't have to be quite so, um, it doesn't have to be quite so on purpose. They can you can open your Facebook feed and see that I was on this podcast and listen to another podcast and then find an article and it's all connected and it's easier to find. Yeah, we were talking about earlier how AI just changes the whole game. Like we'll just get all the video clips and all the audio put together, have AI cut it, then as done and then have another AI do a bunch of short clips and stuff. Like it's it's kind of kind of ridiculous to a certain extent like how much AI is already like implemented it into our lives and like just making stuff easier mm-hmm. because it was even like the wasn't like the writer strike or something like that because like in hollywood was it yeah it was something like, like that like i don't know if it was last year or Be- two because they just have like the AI, ai stuff that can just pretty much do everything just have ai type up a script and then you're pretty much good do you, do you see that affecting like ai stuff your your guys' stuff at all not at this point um i did have somebody email me it was a journalism student that asked me They sent me a specific article that I had written and asked me if I'd used AI. And, of course, in my brain, I'm like, AI? I'm thinking like I'm cattle. I'm like, what? (laughs) What are you talking about? Which cat did I name AI? (laughs) Well, in my world, that's artificial insemination. I was like, "Uh, this was not about breeding cattle. It was like about wheat. (laughs) What are you talking about? And I was like, oh, that AI. (laughs) Gotcha. But um, she... (laughs) Asked me specifically if I had utilized AI to write the story. I was like, I don't know. I'm not that hip. Sorry. Thanks for the compliment. Thanks, though. (laughs) We do use it a little bit on some of our stuff with Western Ag Network, coming up with those little reels and clips. And that is kind of amazing that you can just, that it finds it. Like, how did you, how did you just know? Just know. Do you you think social media has been a net positive for for everything or a net negative? Because, like, when social media first came out, it's pretty much whoever had the, loud, the loudest voice was considered to be right. And now I feel like it's changing a little bit. Um, but when, when like a few years ago, even the loudest voice is always right. Yeah. And people would just listen to that and just take it as fact. And now it's like not so true because there's, there's a lot more creators out there who are actually putting the real truth out there, the, the real hard hitting facts. Yeah. The problem is that anybody can put it out there and claim <coughs> yeah. that it's facts. <laughs> True. Like, that's part of the problem. So it's still kind of the, the loudest thing wins. I think what's frustrating to me about social media, and we talked a little bit about, you know, telling our story to consumers as agriculture producers. My Facebook friends are all kind of similar to me. <laughs> I don't have anybody that's, I mean, I do. I have a few that are 
very different and live very different lives and like friends from high school that are they're very different from what I'm doing. But, you know, if I post something, it's not being picked up by all of like whoever your friends are on Facebook because we're such in our own little, <coughs> they're Venn diagrams and they're connected, but mm -hmm. the majority of it is kind of the usual suspects. And that's really frustrating. But I think it's it's positive because you can seek out that information and and if you're if you're savvy then you can kind of think <coughs> about what those sources are and the quality of them. I did just record a podcast episode though speaking of um with a gal whose daughter um ended her own life and it was in part because of the the things that she was being exposed to on social media, you know, the, she was saying that there were live suicide videos and lots of things encouraging kids to self-harm and all sorts of crazy stuff and things that are telling kids that they're, they're worthless and that they should end their own lives. And obviously that's not coming up on my feed because mm -hmm. my feed is like recipes and cow bios. So I'm just not in that world. But it, it happens, and we know that social media is very addictive. And, I mean, you can look at my phone on my use time, and you see that. But So I think that that is incredibly negative. But from a, a greater, like from a business standpoint, I think it's been net positive, though, <laughs> albeit kind of annoying at yeah, times. Because with stuff like that, <laughs> they can even, like, target specific audiences. To, like Because there was a while back they were – they're, they had like this kid show that was, it looked like, from the outside perspective, it looked like it was just a kid show. But within the kid show, they'd be doing like weird stuff like, oh, you should be doing this stuff. And like, you should be hitting other kids. and stuff. It was just like weird stuff that they can, that they can do now. And who um, does that? Yeah. Like just, who, who has all of those skills and talents and decides, you know what I'm going to do? Try to mess up little kids' psyches. It just makes no sense yeah. to me. Yeah. And then with the. Uh, <laughs> with like, a, like I guess the journalism perspective, and like with when people actually want to know what what the truth is about something, I feel like people have gone lazy with just having social media and everything readily available that they'll just believe the first thing that they, that they see instead of actually doing their own research. Because yeah. I feel social media has made it a lot easier for like we were saying earlier for anybody to put out what they want out there, but it's also been easier for people to just do a little bit of research. Like it doesn't take that much time to dive into a topic a little bit deeper to know what's actually going on behind the scenes. Yeah. And just because it's on Facebook doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> yeah. and, like, and like on the business side, I think it's like, like, like for you, Eric, I don't know if, you, what do you think if it's a net positive or net negative for like, because as a business perspective, it sucks to think about it that way, but it's like, it's your fault if people don't know about you. Yeah. And it's like social media. It's, it's a vehicle you could use. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to use the vehicle, but it, sometimes you might get there faster or I guess more people will know about you mm -hmm. or what do you what do you think like and you're, and for, you're, for the like, business perspective it's for sure a net positive because now you have instead of say I have a store here in, in Fort Morgan and my, my potential reach is only the people in the city um, or even limited even to the people from that part of town because not a lot not everybody drives through the, the whole city or whatever um, but now with social media you have the ability to reach hundreds of thousands of people if you use it right. And, that's, and that's the thing that people, I think, aren't utilizing correctly because they do have the ability to reach a lot more people, but do they want to or do they have the capacity to actually support those people? Or, or do they really believe in the product or service that they're selling? Because if you really that's believe true. in it, you'll be like, I'm doing a disservice to the people, them not knowing about what I do, mm -hmm. I think, if you 100% believe in it. But I mean, do they believe in it or do they not know it's really a vehicle? Yeah. And I guess what it all comes down to, like, the, I guess the goals of the business. Do they want to help as many people as they can or do they want to just limit themselves and just, oh, I'll be good here? Because if they actually have a good product or service that can help a lot of people, they'd make the effort or they should make the effort to reach a lot more people to be able to just help that much more. What about for you? What are, what are your goals for writing? Like, what's the purpose that you write for? I, you know, there's not a whole lot of us that are writing about agriculture. It's, 
it's not a huge group of journalists. <laughs> so I think it's important. And I think based on, um, you know, there's been a lot of negative and a lot of destructive things coming at agriculture, specifically in Colorado. And I think it's important that there's some accountability lent. You know, I never, I didn't set out to lend accountability to local, to like state government, but that's what happened. But I, you know, it's a huge industry. It's a $7 billion industry here in Colorado, and it, it needs to have a good voice, and it needs to have, have that. And I, you know, I'm thinking about social media and agriculture, and we have so many ag influencers, advocates, and <laughs> I just don't know that they know a what the of, secret sauce is. To A lot of influencers without influence? Or, or yes, how, how? And, but like my social media... Um, my numbers stay very static, but I think it's kind of a small group, like not, I'm not everybody's cup of tea and, but, and I have people that follow me for my political columns that would not appreciate cow bios, <laughs> like <laughs> somebody that's involved in the political scene in Denver, who's reading this just from that perspective is probably not going to be interested in a cow bio, but, and a lot of my cow bio people do not care about legislation. So I'm kind of a weirdo in that way, but I think there's, I don't know what the sauce is to like go and reach all of those people that are your target audience. And I think that's where a lot of people struggle because even if you go viral, it may not be your target audience. It's probably not your target audience. It's the people that are going to actually invest in in that whatever it is that you're putting out. Talk to me about the the influencers. You're saying the ag influence or advocates, like advocates, yeah. Like what what are they what are they doing? What are they saying? Oh, you know, just countering misinformation primarily, but you know, to each their own. And I'm not picking on the people that are choosing to do this, but. We're going to write a cow bio on you. Guys. We are. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> the ones that are like doing the TikTok dances and lip syncing to stuff and pointing to the words that never line up with their finger. And not that I know how to do that either, but I think if you're <laughs> going to point at the words that aren't there, then you should line them up. Rehearse it a couple of times, huh? Maybe. <laughs> and But seriously, if you ever see me doing those things on social media, you can assume that I've been kidnapped and I'm signaling you for help, that I've been <laughs> abducted, I'm in danger, you need to contact the authorities because lip syncing and pointing to the words that aren't there is not my jam. Yeah. Like, but, likewise, I, I made a video the other day yeah. saying like, I'm probably not going to, I'm not the, the TikTok dancer, you're not going to see me TikTok dancing. No. And if I, if I, like I, if I am, please help. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Send help. So not, not even if it'll let you guys reach a bigger audience? That's not the audience I want. I, my, that's not, those are not my people. That is not my tribe. And I, you know, all of these advocates are wanting to counter that information. And I think the thing that to me, looking at it from the inside, outside, because I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to counter misinformation in that way. I don't know that making that TikTok video and pointing to the words is going to reach that target audience because most of the people that are following you are involved in agriculture anyway. <laughs> so I don't know what the what the key is. Uh, you know, that's the question for you guys is how you get past into that new audience so that you're not just preaching to the choir. That's what's nice. You know, with my fence post gig, it is very much preaching to the choir. I mean, they're ag people and they're reading about ag and that's what they care about, and that's what they're there for, and that's what they've been there coming for for over 40 years to that publication. My Denver Gazette, Colorado Politics, Colorado Springs Gazette, that's very consumer-facing, very front-range-facing, and it's different. It's not preaching to the choir, but it's, it's different in the way that if I talk about AI in a column, I better clarify what I'm talking about. If I say AI in the Fitz Post, we're talking about breeding cattle. If I say AI in the Denver Gazette, we need to clarify. AI, artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm interested in Eric's response. Are, are we yeah. going to see you TikTok dancing soon, or you um, seem pretty highly interested? No. I'm just wondering. No. I was just I was just curious. Oh, okay. I was about to put the speaker and music for you. I was, I'll cheer you on if, you're, if that's what you want. No, but it's like what you said, is that 
that's not the audience I don't want to target. Like, even you might it, get more even views. Even if it will help you grow more? You might get more views, but what's the purpose behind those views? They just want to, they just, they're just wanting to see you dance. And I don't want to dance. So it's like the, the puppet master, who you're dancing for. Nobody wants to see my, me dance. It would be bad. <laughs> That's interesting. I was just, I was just wondering because Eric, he seemed highly interested. I was just I, know. I was just yeah. wondering on that. But so so the people like we're saying like, going back to like the influencers, you're saying that they're doing that stuff. So are they just doing it like getting just random information, just kind of doing stuff with it, and they no, just take just, a picture with a cow, and now they're they're just at, they're like pros. ag facts. They, they get and the new Beyonce them. TikTok song going with a with a calf and a little. Oh yeah. Little, oh, they got a new song. Now? I haven't heard it. Yeah. Okay. I have heard that, and I'm not very hip. You okay. need to get with the program. No, I'm, I'm behind. I'm behind. <laughs> <laughs> but I think like one thing that's very powerful that they're utilizing is the power of video. Because mm-hmm. it's just so easy to consume. Um, like if you go, would I rather read an article or would I rather have that person make a video and just tell me about it? It's like it's it's a lot easier to ju- to digest information that way. Or you could listen to a podcast, shoot for the middle, no dancing. Yeah, and podcast like the one we got going on right now. Yeah. Or your podcast? What's your podcast name? It's the Pro Ag Podcast. Which people should go check out. For sure. If they want to know about AI. Yeah. <laughs> the right AI. <laughs> and a different kind of AI. Yeah, we talk a lot about uh, legislation and stuff that's facing rural Colorado. I I host it with Jason Santamasso, who's the auctioneer up at Sterling Livestock Commission. So we have a little bit different take on things than a lot of people do, but we talk about the big stories that I'm covering. And, you know, we had Don Gittleson on. He was the guy, the uh, North Park rancher up by Walden that had the 23 depredations, um, wolf depredations on his place. We've had um, a lot of, we do a lot about rural mental health and the accessibility of the services and the legislation that affects that. And our, our initiative is to check your cows, check your fields and check your neighbors. Because that's what needs to happen out here. How how much of a big deal is that, the rural mental health? I think it's huge. Um, farmers and ranchers are three times more likely to take their own lives than the general population of similar demographics outside of agriculture. Really? And Why young. Is that? That's, that's lots interesting. of. Uh, yeah, it is. And, you know, there's a lot of pressures and they're all outside of your control. They're a lot of times pretty isolated. They are um, just at the mercy of the weather and the markets and the banker and the legislature who are making decisions, you know, in clean shoes in Denver, far, far away from these guys that are out here calving and checking cows at three o'clock in the morning. And it's economically tough and there's just not, not many services out here available. Not that the ones that are are here aren't great they are but the accessibility is tricky and there's definitely a stigma and that's one of the things that Santa Maso and I work work on is we've talked about our own mental health struggles and our own experiences and saying that you know if we can sit here and talk about it then you can too and taking that responsibility because a lot of people say well you need to reach out for help well maybe they can't maybe you need to reach out to your neighbor and say hey I haven't seen you around you doing okay or, you know, we've been knee deep in calving and it's been tough and the weather's been terrible. How are you doing? Do you need anything? Because we, you know, we're comfortable calling our neighbors if our cows are out for some help. But if our mental cows are out, we need to be able to reach out too. But mm, we kind of flip the tables on it to, to say, you know, you need to check your neighbors, not just count on them to reach out for help. I like that one. If your cows get out of the fence, yeah, that's, that's a good one. And sometimes your mental cows just are everywhere. <laughs> it's crazy, though. Like, they're, what, three times more likely to, to commit suicide? Do you think it's just because you, maybe you're out there? Sometimes you, like, there's no one, not all of them, but sometimes you don't have, like, just anyone to talk to. You're just out there, just you alone and your thoughts. I well, mean, maybe people, that's like, look at it, it. Like, too, like, oh, you're out in the open. Like, that must be so peaceful. Like, you're away from the city, away from everybody. To a certain extent, like, yes, it is peaceful, but then like, you're saying, like, the stuff behind the scenes that people don't see is, like, you're relying on the weather, you're relying on the markets, you're relying on the legislature. There's, like, mm-hmm. so much stuff that you have to, that you're, like, at the mercy of. It's kind of hard to... 
hard yeah. to track of everything. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff that you just can't control, and and it's. I think there's a lot of pressure to to keep the family tradition alive and to keep that heritage alive and to keep the ranch or keep the farm. You know, enter any Hallmark movie ever. <laughs> we have to keep the farm. Yellowstone, <laughs> right? <The show. laughs> Somebody on social media the other day said that his wife ruined Yellowstone for him by saying that it was just a Hallmark movie for dudes. Kind of hard to argue against that, though. It is. I never thought of that. And I think I like Yellowstone, but it's also kind of stupid. I would like to write with Taylor Sheridan, though. I was going to say, how, how, how much, I guess, real life is like <clears throat> the Yellowstone show to like how it actually is? Well, I mean, there's... Those problems do exist. The losing the land to um, to the city development folks. pressures, stuff like that. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And the legislator legislation issues are very real. But we don't have a rip at my house. Like <laughs> no one's gonna. No one's gonna take them to the train station. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's. I don't even know where the train station is. <laughs> yeah. No. I have a feeling like it's. Obviously, it's a show that's uh, dramatic effects and all that stuff, but I feel like behind the scenes, a lot of that stuff actually is going on. They're ha- they are having those conversations with people, like mm-hmm. with like the developers and all that stuff, but it's just, from the outside perspective, we're like, oh, yeah, they're building new houses over here. Cool. But it's like, what did what had to take place for that to happen? Oh, yeah. You're Who's just getting not moved sit- out of the land? You're just not sitting at the table. That's why you don't know about it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You're not invited at the table to or on the menu. Yeah. Yeah, we're all we all live down over by Wiggins, and every time I bring my kids to school, I see all those new houses, and I just think, ugh, there's not enough water to support all of those houses. Like, what are we doing here? And we're taking good, maybe not great ag land, but some of that's pretty decent ag land out of um, production to put houses in. And that's that's frustrating from my perspective, but I like. I, I, I live understand. in those houses, so na- next time I Uh-oh. pull into my house, I'm gonna. You're picture, part of the problem. I'm gonna picture Rachel like she's like this motherfucker, like <laughs> using, taking my water. <laughs> well, supposedly they're gonna have like all these other like fields for the kids and stuff, but they haven't even done that. It's been like what three, four years already. Yeah, it's been a while. I don't Before. know if they ever will either. I mean, but it's, I think it's important, like how we're talking about earlier, like some people need help; they need a. They should be reaching out, but they don't know where to go or how to do it. So it's uh, it's like almost like reaching out to them, like putting yourself out mm-hmm. there more. Like even like with the mental health stuff, but then also like with just uh, like news, like uh, like the agriculture news, like people who don't people here around here might know, but people in the city might not know it. So it's like how to reach them. You got to go out and reach them out. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, you you said you've kind of dealt with some stuff in the past like what are some things to look out for if people are dealing with this stuff so you kind of know like well any kind of changes in routine like if they typically go to the cafe and have coffee or or go to the cattlemen's meetings or hang out and talk at the feed store or you know whatever if they're not doing that and withdrawing that's a big deal if they're normally pretty put together and I this is a tricky one to say in the middle of calving season as I sit here looking like I just got run over by a cow in a windstorm (laughs) which may have happened (laughs) if they're looking really disheveled or like they haven't showered I did shower um (laughs) if they're but if they're looking like really disheveled and (laughs) like they haven't showered have maybe losing or gaining a lot of weight or just not taking care of themselves that can be a big big red flag and just those those changes. And, you know, agriculture is so seasonal. You know, kind of everybody right now is calving, and we're all kind of keeping our heads down and doing that, and it's like suffering in numbers. <laughs> Not that it's all suffering, but sometimes it really sucks. It's been pretty good this year so far, but I'm sure that we're going to have a gnarly storm at some point. But it's one of those things where we're kind of all in the same boat at the same time, which makes it kind of – kind of good and kind of bad but that way you kind of know what your neighbors are going through because Mm -hmm. you're doing it too like during the bomb cyclone which was a couple years ago 19 i guess that was awful and that we didn't shut pickups off for days 
We didn't even come to the house. My kids were at my mother-in-law's and we were just checking cows. That's all we did. And it was, it was terrible. And I can't imagine if you didn't have some support in place there, that would have made that all the more hard. And if that was one more stick on the candles, the candle, the camel's back, I can see where that would cause a major catastrophe. Give, help me, give me a perspective of, because people think you're just cabin. They probably think you just had one little baby and then that's, that's it. <laughs> how much, how much, give it, gives like a, an average number, like how, how much we're talking about. Well, we'll, we'll have close to 200 calves on the ground by the time we're done. But, you know, we're not huge. There's guys that are calving out 700, 800 cows and it's, it's just a big job and it's, that's all you do. <laughs> how much people, like, is it just you? I mean, you're no, we're, uh, we're a family much? operation, so it's me and my Which? husband and my in-laws. Okay. And we're all there. and so, so that helps. Like, we split up the the nighttime calving checks. And if if there's a problem, like this morning we had to pull a calf, well, we had help. Like, there were other people there. So um, we we have quite a bit of support. And a lot of guys have have that kind of support. But... Um, you know, it can still be a pretty isolating thing just being in rural Colorado or rural America and being in agriculture. It can just be that way. Which for, for a podcast that we did in the past, remember we're talking about the people were like, wait, the, the, the meat isn't made just in Walmart and the, and the warehouses in the back. Oh, yeah. I think people should, they should, you know. Go get a, go chaperone you and see how the. <laughs> take, take a field trip. Take a field trip and see how, like how the process is because I think it's interesting just how a lot of people don't have that perspective on it. Yeah. And and I think a lot of people, the thing I hear the most from my column in the gazettes and Colorado politics is, oh, my grandpa farmed or my great uncle had a farm and milked some cows. So we all have that connection, but it's several generations back for most of us. And so that's kind of interesting that they have like positive feelings about it. So when a ballot initiative comes across to introduce wolves into ranch country, like grab a hold of those positive feelings that you have about your grandpa's farm and don't vote to do that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just think about how that affects, but we're just such a small percentage of the population that it gets overlooked. It's It's interesting because we've, we've had that talk before. Like we try to think about it, like that politics don't affect business. But it affects everything. Like you're saying, there's some law that passes. Like, you don't know what's going to happen. There's something that could just pass, and it just flipped your whole business upside down. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that they try to not intertwine politics and business, but you need to know what's going on kind of in politics, what laws are changing for your tax purposes or for your farming, your ranching, whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. And people... Not just business, like everyday life. Oh, yeah. Because that plastic really bag, bag, bag man. when you go to the <laughs> store. See, great minds there. <laughs> yeah, I, it baffles me how many people say, "Well, I just don't follow politics," and I, I understand, like, I get it. It's a lot, but you need elections matter. You need to at least vote with for people that you know will do a good job and represent you. In so, when the plastic bag ban comes up, there'll be a reasonable voice for one way or the other, or wolves or you know, whatever, there's a lot of red tape that gets discussed down there that has, has a lot of effects like the 28 cent, uh, delivery fee that we have to charge in Colorado for anything that's sold in the state that has to be delivered by a vehicle. Really? I didn't know about this one. Yeah. I had to do that. I sell a lot of books and so I have to do the 28 cent, but I only have to do it in Colorado. So I had to like call the website company and say, I need to do this. And they're like, but why? Because it's the law now. Apparently. <laughs> Turns so out. So if you sell anything, if you take it by vehicle. Or if it's it? taken by vehicle. So like if you ship an Inceptions podcast sticker, you have to charge 28 cents to that person if they're in Colorado for a delivery fee. Wow. Okay. Or if you ship a semi load of whatever. Dropping soon. Rachel just put the, the seed, the plant of the seed. There you go. Dropping soon. Inceptions stickers yeah i'm waiting on mine <laughs> <laughs> you just dropped the seed i like it but it's interesting because we're talking about like proteins and stuff and i've had conversations with people that are like 
that they like try like our our dad's meat and stuff, and they're like, oh, it's because that tastes weird. I like how the store tastes. It's like, no, you just got used to all the chemicals and all the processing that takes place, that you forgot or you never knew how natural or like organic beef tastes. Yeah, you just got used to all this stuff, and it's kind of like, take a step back. Like, where's your meat actually coming from? Where you actually, do you actually know where it's going from? Is that actually a good source, or is it just a bunch of just random stuff thrown into well, the grinder? You know, we have a very safe food supply. So not to, to argue with you, your dad's meat is awesome. And if somebody has the opportunity to buy direct from the ranch, by all means, they should. But a lot of people don't have that opportunity. And your dad, if he sells beef through, like, the sale barn and into a feed yard, then some of his ends up at Safeway or Walmart or whatever, too. And ours does, too. And we sell to the consumer or we sell to the, the feeder and the packer, and it goes through those those outlets. So one of the things on social media that frustrates me all the time is they'll post pictures of ground beef. And one of them is like a direct from the ranch packaging that like the packaging is different. If you have it done at your choice meats, Mm -hmm. the packaging is different than at Walmart. There's air and whether or not it's been frozen and it's just different colors. It's not because anything gross is in it. It's just because the air affects the color of the meat. Or one's leaner than the other. Or one's leaner than the other or whatever. And they'll say, you know, this is this is unsafe and you can't trust it. And it's like, dude, but that could be ours. <laughs> so I think any time you cast doubt on the safety of the food supply to to market your own, then you're doing something wrong. But I think marketing your dad's meat being direct from the rancher and you can know your rancher and you can go directly to him and you can go see the baby calves and you can know that yours came directly from Wiggins and that the feed that they purchased came from local farmers, like all of those things together, perfect and wonderful. Mm-hmm. So not to geek out on you. I'm yeah. sorry. I've done that no, twice. That's good. There's, good. there's just a lot of things just to go down. I've heard like, <laughs> as long as it's packaged in the United States and it's, it can be considered USDA approved or all that stuff. So, so that's another that, rabbit hole. Yeah, they're the rabbit <laughs> yeah, hole. That's so, a fun so one. I've heard stories where like people Australia. Have, like, uh, Australia, they bring it a lot from Australia. From Australia or Argentina or other places. Like you hope they're doing the best what they, they can with their cattle, but sometimes they got to inject stuff into the cattle just to keep it alive or to make it taste better or whatever. Or you don't know what they're feeding it too. So it's like I mean, yeah, there's packaged in, different. in the United States, it's like. Yeah. And then there's a lot of the stuff with labels, too. I mean, it's just, you just buy a label, and now it's like... Well, if it's organic. processed in the U.S., then it's inspected by the USDA. So <clears throat> it's coming from some from an animal that was, that was healthy. Now, if we're talking about animals that come from Paraguay, which is a big deal right now, there's a lot of legislators, including Caraveo, who is our congresswoman here in Colorado, one of them, the the Paraguay producers and the government have been in trouble for years about unsafe conditions and lower standards of production and it's just a lower quality product and they the US producers don't want Paraguay beef brought in because if it comes in on the hoof it carries it has the potential to carry diseases and if it's processed here then it can be labeled a product of the US which is mm-hmm. kind of a shortfall in the in the whole process, but like the whole, it's and a and whole that's thing. what I was kind of getting at. Like, you, you, we all want to believe that yes, our food supply is like the best, but there's also those instances where stuff like that happens. Yeah, and, and we we have no control over it, which kind of seems crazy. If it's coming into the country, you think you can set some regulations or yeah something to kind of like protect it. Right, and there's a lot of countries that we don't allow beef in from those countries, but. And, you know, they can't all be ribeyes, right? Mm-hmm. Taco Bell has to get their beef from somewhere, too. And True. wherever. Right. Now, Taco Bell does not need to. They're, they're not your sponsor, right? No. Uh, I mean, they came out with no. a bunch of new products. I'm super excited for them. Yeah. Do they? No, they got new products, but you just look at them. They're just they look disgusting. It just I looks like it's them. heavily fatty, processed junk and it's just like oh uh, delicious i'm not a fan them. yeah so, so so kind of going back to you a little bit i'm curious 
What has been something in your life that's kept you from moving forward to achieving your next level in whether it could be writing or your personal life? Oh, you know, I feel like I've, I'm doing what I want to be doing. And I think that's a big win. You know, I wish I were doing it on a bigger stage. And so that secret sauce of social media and, but, you know, it would be hard for me to write and to do things at a national level and still be on the ranch every day feeding cows. So it's a give and take. Well, I already got the speaker for the TikTok dance. He'll get you. He'll get you hooked up. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Welcome out there in the pattern. Just yeah, start, start we're, going. We're pointing at words. We're going to be amazing. <laughs> well, Rachel, I appreciate you for joining us today. It was awesome. Thanks for informing us on a lot of. I mean, we're we're not experts in this, so it's always good to have somebody that knows more about it. You know, teach us a couple things. Yeah, so I appreciate it. Was it. If it someone was wants to get in contact with you or know a little bit more about what you got going on, where can they find you? They can find me on uh, Facebook and Instagram at, at Rachel Writes, and um, rachelgable.com is where my books are, and then uh, the Fence Post magazine online and in print, Western Ag Network on the air, and Denver Gazette, Colorado Springs Gazette, and Colorado Politics online and in print. Told you, it's hard to get away from. <laughs> <laughs> and where can they find your podcast? Where is this? Oh, yeah. So Apple and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, and it's Pro Ag Podcast. Okay, awesome. So, yeah, guys, go check it. Go check out all her stuff and make sure you become a fan and subscribe to her podcast, subscribe to our podcast, and we'll catch you guys on the next one. Appreciate it. Yeah.